will talk about, it ties in really nicely, talk about uh, crucial interaction between climate, between water resources, energy supply, and ultimately food supply. He's the managing director of the largest agri-commodity supply chain company that is based here in our own commodity uh, trading free zone, DMCC, down towards JLT. And he's looking after a network that spans 30 countries uh, in terms of uh, agribusiness. He also chairs the International Confederation for Pulses Trade and Industry. I'd like to welcome, please, Sudaha Toma to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Salaamu Alaikum. Last night was a very nice gala dinner, and I congratulate and say my thanks to the organizers, the wonderful team at um, World Trade Center who, who did organize this excellent theme of food security in insecure Middle East. I, I stand in front of you not as a scientist or a researcher or somebody who had lots of data, so my, my presentation is going to be light on the too much technical insight, but more coming from the business um, and also my experience with the Confederation, uh, which is promoting the, the, uh, at the farming level the growth of um, pulses, beans, lentils, which are the only source of vegetable protein available to the mankind. Rest all is animal protein, be it meat, cheese, dairy, or cream. And also a little bit inside, I, or rather I feel the pain because being born in a farming family in uh, India, in a rural, rural area, so I've seen the pain and the plight of small farmers uh, at a very early age. And then around 20 years ago, I shifted to Dubai. So I've also seen the urban trading, so I try to put all the perspectives in, uh, um, in one phase. The, the world of agriculture and food and water is intricately interrelated. It takes water to create energy, energy to create water, which, needed, which is needed to create the food. So when you, when you look at deep inside, it's, it's very, very, very interrelated. For example, in USA in 2010, they burnt 40% of their corn crop to produce biofuel. Or they, whatever amount they withdraw in terms of water, fresh or uh, saline, it goes to cool the thermal plants, which goes to create energy uh, to create uh, water again. So it's very, very interrelated. And because the, 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 the whole debate about the water, food, energy, and, and with, the, with the interlinking of climate change and uh, biodiesel, it is extremely controversial. Everybody tries, all the countries, all the factions, all the lobby group, they try to protect their own interests. So you come up with very interesting observations. Um, even now, I have many friends who still deny uh, climate change. I still have many friends who, who, who think there's enough water in enough, 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 enough food. So, um, so we have very controversial um, stance on many issues, very, very, very critical issues. So to put it lightly, last year, there's a joke that United Nations put a question to all the countries in the world. The question was, would you please give your honest opinion about the solution to the food and water shortage in the rest of the world? Very simple question, which this was posed to all the countries in the world, major countries. From, from, from first, let me come back from my own country. From India, there was no response because in order to reply properly and very, very emphatically, they set up a parliamentary committee, which has been accused of corruption, so investigation is going on. So till the time that results comes out, there is no response. In Eastern Europe and Asian part, they didn't know what the honest was. In Western Europe and developed world, they didn't know what the shortage meant, and anyway, they couldn't care less. In South America, they didn't know how to say please, so they didn't know, they couldn't understand the question. In USA, they didn't know what the rest of the world meant. They still call their foreign minister secretary of states. In China, I think they couldn't figure out the crux because there was no knowledge or idea about what opinion was. In here, in our very home, in our Middle East, we couldn't figure out what the solution was. In Africa, they simply didn't know what the food and water was. So when you have these kind of misconceptions, perceptions, and, and, and stereotyping, it becomes very difficult to make sense of 
four major uh, things, water, energy, food, and climate change. So with this background, let's look at what happened, how did we reach this position. So we'll go in a very simple manner. I hope I'll try to finish within my time, or I'm going to cannibalize next speaker, who anyway is absent. So I, oh, OK. So we have, we have OK. In 1971, Henry Kissinger is standing in front of the United Nations. He proclaimed that in 10 years' time, the America is going to eradicate the poverty, and there'll be enough food for the world. But only uh, and after this proclamation, after 40 years after he, what he said, it was officially acknowledged by United Nations that there are 1.2 billion hungry people in the world. And each day, about 30, depending whose, whose calculation you believe, about 35 to 45,000 people die, of which 85% are children in poor countries every day. Die. By the time we finish this conference of two days, we'll have 70,000 people dead just because they didn't have enough food and clean drinking water. But this is not a new problem. This whole amalgamation, nexus, how did we reach here? This was, this was brewing from 1960s when we had Green Revolution. And after that, no major technological breakthrough happened. So we had slow but continuous growth in population. And we under-invested in agriculture. That resulted in kind of flattish to slightly increasing global food production. But at the same time, food demand kept increasing because of population pressure. And in the meantime, there was also an angle of using the, the, the bio, uh, bio crops for biofuel, which was unsustainable. I still believe they're unsustainable. Food should, have, should be put to better use. But at the same time, global incomes and in the, in the people disposable money with people kept on rising. And it is still on rising. So that means if you have more money available to middle classes in India and China, they will have more, more disposable income. And they'll try to buy. They'll try to ape the inefficient habits of the people who have taught them the culture. So we, we, we have more reliance on the animal meat, dairy, protein, which is an inefficient mechanism to deliver protein to the masses. And as if this was not enough, the, the, the cost of doing agriculture, all the governments, most of the governments are subsidizing agriculture. So the real, real price or real cost was not coming in the market. Urbanization. As of now, 50% people of the globe, they are is they are staying in the cities. So there is urbanization going to the cities. In 2050, we'll have 70% people living in the cities. That means three person will try to grow the food for 10 people. So that's, that's a huge ask on them. And of course, we have limited renewable resources, land and water. This is non-replaceable. You can't grow, you can't produce more. And because we also did not have any technological breakthrough, we have reached this situation. This is a slow diabetes. It's a slow, but we do not care because this is not something going to happen tomorrow. We just simply keep getting defocused uh, because of financial issues or financial crisis or political uh, problems in many countries. Let's look at what is the status now. This is a fact that in 2050, we will have 9.6 billion people, which means about 2 2.4 people more mouth to feed. And although recently, because of record harvest, the crop prices have come down, agricultural crops, of those crops, who we track. This is, the, again, a blind spot. Of 12 billion odd tons of agricultural crops we produce, only 30% we track. So those are in the media. Those are in our, on our uh, blackberries. But rest, we don't track. So we don't really know really what is happening to those crop dynamics. So they are still in the high, higher price band. Now we look at what is happening to the one by one, we'll take all this global energy challenge. As per international energy outlook 2013 uh, projection, the world energy consumption in 2040 will go up to 57%. Um, 90% of this will come from emerging um, economies. Only 17% is in the developed world. So energy is a big uh, chunk of resource which we need to produce water, which is required to produce food. Climate change. Those who are non-believers and they use different type of models, I must say that I'm a farmer back home, and I see how much 
warm it gets in the, in the winter before it used to be cold, and also the, 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 the river which is flowing on my, my land, it is meandering less and less and there is more siltation, so I can feel in very tangible terms, I don't need to go by many uh, models. But even if we go by that models, IPCC on a recently leaked report in November 2013, they predicted that the sea level will rise up to 80 centimeters and the temperature will rise up to 1.5 percent, which means new agroecological zones and our continuous denial of climate change and leading to our inaction and finally a target which is I think too low and too slow will result in droughts and flooding and making the production it has been predicted that there will be two percent reduction on each decade for productions, which means about 10 percent reduction in, by 2000, 2050. Finally, leading to this situation in 2080, the red color, colored countries are those countries where the food production can go down up to 50 percent. So this is the impact of climate change. Now let's look at the world hunger. The dark countries, the yellowish countries, are those countries which are food insecure. But before we talk about the world hunger, let's look at the world, because we talk about a lot of technical things. In world hunger, if you divide the total food available to the, to the, to the crop, to the, to the masses, and if you divide it by the number of people we have, we have a very comfortable situation of 2,720 calories per person, whereas we don't need more than 2,000 calories to survive. So technically speaking, like water, we have enough uh, food. It's just that it is not available at the right place, at the right time, to the person who can afford. We also have, as a world, we export more than we import food. So we have $800, $800 billion worth of exports to, to, to other countries. Dietary patterns. Dietary patterns are changing all over the world. In poorer countries, in, 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 uh, in West Asia, in um, North Africa, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's more reliance on cereals. So there is more reliance on filling the stomach rather than worrying about the nutrition quality. And at the same time, we're also losing almost 50%, up to 33 to 50% food. Not only at the farm level in poorer countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, but also a lot in the way we transport, the way we store, and the way we store at home, in the kitchen, and the fridge, up to 50 up to 33 to 50 percent wasted, which if you put at a number, it's a staggering 1.2 billion to 2.2 billion tons, uh, depending on the different reports. And the wasting, wasting the food habit is universal. This is not only true to rich countries, to all over the globe. The wasting food is a very, very common habit. And the fight between the nutrition and calorie filling your stomach with the calories is with staples like rice, bread, and potatoes, and cassava continues. We need to increase our yields of all major crops if we have to survive and if we have to grow um, 3 billion tons of cereals from present level of 2.2 billion by 60%. And we, other than maize, so far we have not reached target on any other crops on that one. So as a result, we need to grow 60% more food in 2050. Developing countries have to do it more, otherwise they need to import 100% of their food requirement, especially in the Middle East, where the, the agricultural land and water is in scarcity. Um, but overall, we need to grow 60% more food in 2050. There is a consensus on that. Water, Mark Twain famously said that water is for fighting. And it is also rumored that the fourth world war, the third world war will be fought on the water. So this is a very scarce resource, and this is the only commodity which is available free Nothing else is available free as of in the form of, and also in bottled form at a very expensive price. So, so this is the continuum of, of water. And we have only 3% of fresh water which we use in our, in our agricultural setup, and of which 70%, 66.6% is used by the agriculture. And some startling facts is that today 50% of the global population has less water or the quality of water which was available 2,000 years back to the citizens of Rome. So this is the deterioration we have had in the quality of water. 40 billion people, 40, sorry, 40 billion hours, this is the number of hours 
Africa spends in collecting and bringing the water to the home, which means the entire population of UAE of 8 million, they need to work two, two years. This is the time of um, effort is done when you collect uh, water in Africa. And by 2050, two thirds of the population will form, will face some kind of water scarcity or water shortage, be it economic or, or availability of the water. 1.1 billion people do not have access to clean drinking water, and about 16% have no access to clean water of the total population. And that results into the death of 1.8 billion children in, in each year. The water projection in, for 2050 is up to 50%. This is our water need. When we look at the global, global obesity map, a little bit from, from the malnutrition point of view, and if we multiply the number of malnourished and hungry people living in these countries, and if you multiply by the area they have, the world will, can be taken over by hungry and thirsty people. This is the redrawn map of the world. So it's a paradox. You have 1.14 billion hungry people, and you have 1.4 people who have who had too much to eat, resulting into a very mismatch, classical mismatch between those who have too much to eat and those who have nothing. This is this. This is the. This is the. This is what I want to you to have uh, look at. As of today, we have one billion hungry people on the planet. These are certified facts. Every day, 24,000 percent people die more than the terrorist attacks, because each day we have 35,000 people dying. One billion do not have access to clean drinking water. 1.2 billion do not have access to economically uh, available water to them. That means it's too expensive for them. And 1.2 billion have no access to the electricity. And every day, 35,000 people die from the hunger and not having clean water. So this is, this is the message. How do we feed 9.6 billion people in, within our lifetime, 2050, including 2 billion additional people we're going to add? is that we have to look at a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the animal protein industry. Each year, we have 300 million metric tons of meat, which requires 4.5 billion tons of agricultural crops to grow. Water footprints of meat and dairy industry are very inefficient. You need 20,000 liters of water to grow one, one kilo of beef, versus you need only four or 500 liters of water to grow other vegetable crops. So at a target of just 10%, this is a simple solution from our practical deliberations from the Confederation and with uh, FAO. If we target 10% replacement of animal protein, that is meat and dairy, with the vegetable protein, which are pulses, beans, lentils, also soybean, basically extracting protein and incorporating in our processing industry, we're going to unleash in the marketplace about 400 to 500 million tons of economical supply of protein. Not the staple, not something which fills your stomach and just makes you full, but something which gives you nutrition. In conclusion, we have to realize that there is no plan B. We need to fix this. If we don't fix this, we will not be left with any uh, foreseeable future. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to have this take home message that if we improve output, the yields in Asia and Africa, where there is a potential exists for up to 200 to 250 percent, and also saving our, uh, our crops from pests and insects and diseases, which has, because we waste about 50% potential is there. And stop wasting food at the table, in the kitchen, in the fridge, another 50% potential. And using a smart protein and not relying unnecessarily on inefficient protein, we can help solve, the, these are practical solutions, we can help solve or at least mitigate the losses within our lifetime. And at least we will have a roadmap. Thank you very much for your attention. I know these are little simplistic views. Uh, please use the networking opportunities though to ask Sudhakar anything on his uh, very interesting presentation. But in the meantime, thank you ever so much for all your time. Thank you.